A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 13 Love Making on Mars. Following the battle with the airships, the community remained within the city for several days, abandoning the homeward march until they could feel reasonably assured that the ships would not return. For to be caught on the open plains with a cavalcade of chariots and children was far from the desire of even so warlike a people as the green Martians. During our period of inactivity, Tars Tarkas had instructed me in many of the customs and arts of war familiar to the Tharks, including lessons in riding and guiding the great beasts which bore the warriors. These creatures, which are known as thoats, are as dangerous and vicious as their masters. But when once subdued, are sufficiently tractable for the purposes of the green Martians. Two of these animals had fallen to me from the warriors whose metal I wore, and in a short time I could handle them quite as well as the native warriors. The method was not at all complicated. If the thoats did not respond with sufficient celerity to the telepathic instructions of their riders, they were dealt a terrific blow between the ears with the butt of a pistol, and if they showed fight this treatment was continued until the brutes either were subdued or had unseated their riders. In the latter case it became a life-and-death struggle between the man and the beast. If the former were quick enough with his pistol he might live to ride again, though upon some other beast. If not, his torn and mangled body was gathered up by his women and burned in accordance with Tharkian custom. My experience with Woola determined me to attempt the experiment of kindness in my treatment of my thoats. First I taught them that they should not unseat me, and even wrapped them sharply between the ears to impress upon them my authority and mastery. Then by degrees I won their confidence in much the same manner as I had adopted countless times with my many mundane mounts. I was ever a good hand with animals, and by inclination, as well as because it brought more lasting and satisfactory results, I was always kind and humane in my dealings with the lower orders. I could take a human life, if necessary, with far less compunction than that of a poor, unreasoning, irresponsible brute. In the course of a few days my thoats were the wonder of the entire community. They would follow me like dogs, rubbing their great snouts against my body in awkward evidence of affection, and respond to my every command with an alacrity and docility which caused the Martian warriors to ascribe to me the possession of some earthly power unknown on Mars. "'How have you bewitched them?' asked Tars Tarkas one afternoon, when he had seen me run my arms far between the great jaws of one of my thoats, which had wedged a piece of stone between two of his teeth while feeding upon the moss-like vegetation within our courtyard. "'By kindness,' I replied. "'You see, Tars Tarkas, the softer sentiments have their value, even to a warrior. In the height of battle, as well as upon the march, I know that my thoats will obey my every command, and therefore my fighting efficiency is enhanced, and I am a better warrior for the reason that I am a kind master. Your other warriors would find it to the advantage of themselves, as well as of the community, to adopt my methods in this respect. Only a few days since you yourself told me that these great brutes, by the uncertainty of their tempers, often were the means of turning victory into defeat, since at a crucial moment they might elect to unseat and rend their riders. "'Show me how you accomplish these results,' was Tars Tarkas' only rejoinder. And so I explained, as carefully as I could, the entire method of training I had adopted with my beasts and later he had me repeat it before Lorquas Tomel and the assembled warriors. That moment marked the beginning of a new existence for the poor Thotes, and before I left the community of Lorquas Tomel I had the satisfaction of observing a regiment of as tractable and docile mounts as one might care to see. The effect on the precision and celerity of the military movements was so remarkable that Lorquas Tomel presented me with a massive anklet of gold from his own leg, 
as a sign of his appreciation of my service to the Horde. On the seventh day following the battle with the aircraft, we again took up the march toward Thark, all probability of another attack being deemed remote by Lorquas Tomel. During the days just preceding our departure, I had seen but little of Deja Thoris, as I had been kept very busy by Taras Tarkas with my lessons in the art of Martian warfare, as well as in the training of my thoats. The few times I had visited her quarters she had been absent, walking upon the streets with Sola, or investigating the buildings in the near vicinity of the plaza. I had warned them against venturing far from the plaza for fear of the great white apes, whose ferocity I was only too well acquainted with. However, since Wula accompanied them in all their excursions, and as Sola was well armed, there was comparatively little cause for fear. On the evening before our departure, I saw them approaching along one of the great avenues which led into the plaza from the east. I advanced to meet them, and telling Sola that I would take responsibility for Deja Thora's safekeeping, I directed her to return to her quarters on some trivial errand. I liked and trusted Sola, but for some reason I desired to be alone with Deja Thoris, who represented to me all that I had left behind upon earth in agreeable and congenial companionship. There seemed bonds of mutual interest between us as powerful as though we had been born under the same roof rather than upon different planets, hurtling through space some forty-eight million miles apart. That she shared my sentiments in this respect I was positive, for on my approach the look of pitiful hopelessness left her sweet countenance to be replaced by a smile of joyful welcome, as she placed her little right hand upon my left shoulder in true red Martian salute. Sarkoja told Sola that you had become a true Thark, she said, and that I would now see no more of you than any of the other warriors. Sarkoja is a liar of the first magnitude, I replied, notwithstanding the proud claim of the Tharks to absolute verity. Deja Thoris laughed. I knew that even though you became a member of the community you would not cease to be my friend. A warrior may change his metal, but not his heart, as the saying is upon Barsoom. I think they have been trying to keep us apart, she continued for whenever you have been off duty, one of the older women of Tars Tarkas' retinue has always arranged to trump up some excuse to get Sola and me out of sight. They have had me down in the pits below the buildings, helping them mix their awful radium powder and make their terrible projectiles. You know that these have to be manufactured by artificial light, as exposure to sunlight always results in an explosion. You have noticed that their bullets explode when they strike an object? Well, the opaque outer coating is broken by the impact, exposing a glass cylinder, almost solid, in the forward end of which is a minute particle of radium powder. The moment the sunlight, even though diffused, strikes this powder it explodes with a violence which nothing can withstand. If you ever witness a night battle, you will note the absence of these explosions, while the morning following the battle will be filled at sunrise with the sharp detonations of exploding missiles fired the preceding night. As a rule, however, non-exploding projectiles are used at night. I have used the word radium in describing this powder, because, in the light of recent discoveries on earth, I believe it to be a mixture of which radium is the base. In Captain Carter's manuscript it is mentioned always by the name used in the written language of helium, and is spelled in hieroglyphics which it would be difficult and useless to reproduce. While I was much interested in Deja Thoris' explanation of this wonderful adjunct to Martian warfare, I was more concerned by the immediate problem of their treatment of her. That they were keeping her away from me was not a matter for surprise but that they should subject her to dangerous and arduous labor filled me with rage. "'Have they ever subjected you to cruelty and ignominy, Dejah Thoris?' I asked, 
feeling the hot blood of my fighting ancestors leap in my veins as I awaited her reply. "'Only in little ways, John Carter,' she answered. "'Nothing that can harm me outside my pride. They know that I am the daughter of ten thousand Jeddaks, that I trace my ancestry straight back without a break to the builder of the first great waterway, and they, who do not even know their own mothers, are jealous of me. At the heart they hate their horrible fates, and so wreak their poor spite on me, who stand for everything they have not, and for all they most crave and never can attain. Let us pity them, my chieftain, for even though we die at their hands, we can afford them pity, since we are greater than they, and they know it. Had I known the significance of those words, my chieftain, as applied by a red Martian woman to a man, I should have had the surprise of my life, but I did not know at that time, nor for many months thereafter. Yes, I still had much to learn upon Barsoom. I presume it is the better part of wisdom that we bow to our fate with as good grace as possible, Dejah Thoris. But I hope, nevertheless, that I may be present the next time that any Martian, green, red, pink, or violet, has the temerity to even so much as frown on you, my princess." Dejah Thoris caught her breath at my last words, and gazed upon me with dilated eyes and quickened breath, and then, with an odd little laugh, which brought roguish dimples to the corners of her mouth, she shook her head and cried, "'What a child! a great warrior, and yet a stumbling little child. What have I done now?" I asked, in sore perplexity. Some day you shall know, John Carter, if we live, but I may not tell you. And I, the daughter of Mors Kajak, son of Tardos Mors, have listened without anger," she soliloquized in conclusion. Then she broke out again into one of her gay, happy, laughing moods joking with me on my prowess as a Thark warrior, as contrasted with my soft heart and natural kindliness. I presume that should you accidentally wound an enemy, you would take him home and nurse him back to health," she laughed. "'That is precisely what we do on earth,' I answered, at least among civilized men." This made her laugh again. She could not understand it for with all her tenderness and womanly sweetness she was still a Martian, and to a Martian the only good enemy is a dead enemy, for every dead foeman means so much more to divide between those who live. I was very curious to know what I had said or done to cause her so much perturbation a moment before, and so I continued to importune her to enlighten me. No, she exclaimed, it is enough that you have said it, and that I have listened. And when you learn, John Carter, and if I be dead, as likely I shall be, ere the further moon has circled Barsoom another twelve times, remember that I listened, and that I smiled. It was all Greek to me, but the more I begged her to explain, the more positive became her denials of my request and so, in very hopelessness, I desisted. Day had now given away to night, and as we wandered along the great avenue lighted by the two moons of Barsoom, and with earth looking down upon us out of her luminous green eye, it seemed that we were alone in the universe, and I at least was content that it should be so. The chill of the Martian night was upon us and removing my silks I threw them across the shoulders of Dejah Thoris. As my arm rested for an instant upon her I felt a thrill pass through every fibre of my being, such as contact with no other mortal had ever produced. And it seemed to me that she had leaned slightly toward me, but of that I was not sure. Only I knew that as my arm rested there across her shoulders longer than the act of adjusting the silk required, she did not draw away, nor did she speak. And so, in silence, we walked the surface of a dying world. But in the breast of one of us, at least, had been born that which is ever oldest, yet ever new. 
I loved Dejah Thoris. The touch of my arm upon her naked shoulder had spoken to me in words I would not mistake, and I knew that I had loved her since the first moment that my eyes had met hers that first time in the plaza of the dead city of Korad. Chapter 14 A Duel to the Death My first impulse was to tell her of my love, and then I thought of the helplessness of her position wherein I alone could lighten the burden of her captivity, and protect her, in my poor way, against the thousands of hereditary enemies she must face upon our arrival at Thark. I could not chance causing her additional pain or sorrow by declaring a love which, in all probability, she did not return. Should I be so indiscreet, her position would be even more unbearable than now and the thought that she might feel that I was taking advantage of her helplessness, to influence her decision was the final argument which sealed my lips. "'Why are you so quiet, Dejah Thoris?' I asked. "'Possibly you would rather return to Sola and your quarters?' "'No,' she murmured. "'I am happy here. I do not know why it is that I should always be happy and contented when you, John Carter, a stranger, are with me. Yet at such times it seems that I am safe, and that with you I shall soon return to my father's court and feel his strong arms about me, and my mother's tears and kisses on my cheek. "'Do people kiss, then, upon Barsoom?' I asked, when she had explained the word she used, in answer to my inquiry as to its meaning. "'Parents, brothers, and sisters, yes. And,' she added in a low, thoughtful tone, lovers. And you, Dejah Thoris, have parents and brothers and sisters? Yes. And a lover? She was silent, nor could I venture to repeat the question. The man of Barsoom, she finally ventured, does not ask personal questions of women except his mother and the woman he has fought for and won. But I have fought, I started and then I wished my tongue had been cut from my mouth, for she turned even as I caught myself and ceased, and drawing my silks from her shoulder she held them out to me, and without a word, and with head held high, she moved with the carriage of the queen she was toward the plaza and the doorway of her quarters. I did not attempt to follow her, other than to see that she reached the building in safety, but, directing Woola to accompany her, I turned disconsolately and entered my own house. I sat for hours, cross-legged and cross-tempered, upon my silks, meditating upon the queer freaks chance plays upon us poor devils of mortals. So this was love! I had escaped it for all the years I had roamed the five continents and their encircling seas, in spite of beautiful women and urging opportunity in spite of a half-desire for love and a constant search for my ideal, it had remained for me to fall furiously and hopelessly in love with a creature from another world, of a species, similar possibly, yet not identical with mine. A woman who was hatched from an egg, and whose span of life might cover a thousand years, whose people had strange customs and ideas, a woman whose hopes, whose pleasures, whose standards of virtue and of right and wrong might vary as greatly from mine as did those of the green Martians. Yes, I was a fool, but I was in love, and though I was suffering the greatest misery I had ever known, I would not have it otherwise for all the riches of Barsoom. Such is love, and such are lovers wherever love is known. To me Dejah Thoris was all that was perfect and all that was virtuous and beautiful and noble and good. I believe that, from the bottom of my heart, from the depth of my soul, on that night in Korad, as I sat cross-legged upon my silks, while the near moon of Barsoom raced through the western sky toward the horizon, and lighted up the gold and marble and jeweled mosaics of my world-old chamber. And I believe it today, as I sit at my desk, in the little study overlooking the Hudson. Twenty years have intervened, 
For ten of them I lived and fought for Dejah Thoris and her people, and for ten I have lived upon her memory. The morning of our departure for Thark dawned clear and hot, as do all Martian mornings, except for the six weeks when the snow melts at the poles. I sought out Dejah Thoris in the throng of departing chariots, but she turned her shoulder to me, and I could see the red blood mount to her cheek. With a foolish inconsistency of love, I held my peace when I might have pled ignorance of the nature of my offence, or at least the gravity of it, and so effected, at worst, a half-conciliation. My duty dictated that I must see that she was comfortable, and so I glanced into her chariot and rearranged her silks and furs. In doing so, I noted with horror that she was heavily chained by one ankle to the side of the vehicle. "'What does this mean?' I cried, turning to Sola. "'Sarkoja thought it best,' she answered, her face betokening her disapproval of the procedure. Examining the manacles, I saw that they fastened with a massive spring-lock. "'Where is the key, Sola? Let me have it.' "'Sarkoja wears it, John Carter,' she answered. I turned without further word and sought out Tars Tarkas, to whom I vehemently objected to the unnecessary humiliations and cruelties, as they seemed to my lover's eyes, that were being heaped upon Dejah Thoris. "'John Carter,' he answered, "'if ever you and Dejah Thoris escape the Tharks, it will be upon this journey. We know that you will not go without her. You have shown yourself a mighty fighter, and we do not wish to manacle you, so we hold you both in the easiest way that will yet ensure security. I have spoken." I saw the strength of his reasoning at a flash, and knew that it were futile to appeal from his decision, but I asked that the key be taken from Sarkoja, and that she be directed to leave the prisoner alone in the future. This much, Tars Tarkas, you may do for me in return for the friendship that I must confess I feel for you. Friendship? he replied, "'There is no such thing, John Carter. But have your will. I shall direct that Sarkoja cease to annoy the girl, and I myself will take the custody of the key.' "'Unless you wish me to assume the responsibility,' I said, smiling. He looked at me long and earnestly before he spoke. "'Were you to give me your word that neither you nor Dejah Thoris would attempt to escape until after we have safely reached the court of Tal Hajis, you might have the key and throw the chains into the river Is. "'It were better that you held the key, Tars Tarkas,' I replied. He smiled and said no more, but that night, as we were making camp, I saw him unfasten Dejah Thoris' fetters himself. With all his cruel ferocity and coldness, there was an undercurrent of something in Tars Tarkas which he seemed ever battling to subdue. Could it be a vestige of some human instinct come back from an ancient forebear to haunt him with the horror of his people's ways? As I was approaching Dejah Thoris' chariot, I passed Sarkoja, and the black, venomous look she accorded me was the sweetest balm I had felt for many hours. Lord, how she hated me! It bristled from her so palpably that one might almost have cut it with a sword. A few moments later I saw her deep in conversation with a warrior named Zad, a big, hulking, powerful brute, but one who had never made a kill among his own chieftains, and a second name only with the medal of some chieftain. It was this custom which entitled me to the names of either of the chieftains I had killed. In fact, some of the warriors addressed me as Dotar Sojat, a combination of the surnames of the two warrior chieftains whose medal I had taken, or in other words, whom I had slain in fair fight. As Sarkoja talked with Zad, he cast occasional glances in my direction, while she seemed to be urging him very strongly to some action. I paid little attention to it at the time, but the next day I had good reason to recall the circumstances and at the same time gain a slight insight into the depths of Sarkoja's hatred and the lengths to which she was capable of going to wreak her horrid vengeance on me. Dejah Thoris would have none of me again on this evening, and though I spoke her name she neither replied 
nor conceded by so much as the flutter of an eyelid that she realized my existence. In my extremity I did what most other lovers would have done, I sought word from her through an intimate. In this instance it was Sola, whom I intercepted in another part of the camp. "'What is the matter with Dejah Thoris?' I blurted out at her. "'Why will she not speak to me?' Sola seemed puzzled herself, as though such strange actions on the part of two humans were quite beyond her, as indeed they were, poor child. "'She says you have angered her, and that is all she will say, except that she is the daughter of a Jed and the granddaughter of a Jeddak and she has been humiliated by a creature who could not polish the teeth of her grandmother's Sorak. I pondered over this report for some time, finally asking, What might a Sorak be, Sola? A little animal about as big as my hand, which the Red Martian women keep to play with, explained Sola. Not fit to polish the teeth of her grandmother's cat. I must rank pretty low in the consideration of Dejah Thoris, I thought but I could not help laughing at the strange figure of speech, so homely and in this respect so earthly. It made me homesick, for it sounded very much like not fit to polish her shoes, and then commenced a train of thought quite new to me. I began to wonder what my people at home were doing. I had not seen them for years. There was a family of Carters in Virginia who claimed close relationship with me. I was supposed to be a great-uncle, or something of the kind equally foolish. I could pass anywhere for twenty-five to thirty years of age, and to be a great-uncle always seemed the height of incongruity, for my thoughts and feelings were those of a boy. There was two little kiddies in the Carter family whom I loved, and who had thought there was no one on earth like Uncle Jack. I could see them just as plainly as I stood there under the moonlit skies of Barsoom and I longed for them as I had never longed for any mortals before. By nature a wanderer I had never known the true meaning of the word home, but the great hall of the Carters had always stood for all that the word did mean to me, and now my heart turned toward it from the cold and unfriendly peoples I had been thrown amongst. For did not even Dejah Thoris despise me? I was a low creature, so low, in fact, that I was not even fit to polish the teeth of her grandmother's cat, and then my saving sense of humor came to my rescue, and laughing, I turned into my silks and furs and slept upon the moon-haunted ground the sleep of a tired and healthy fighting man. We broke camp the next day at an early hour and marched with only a single halt until just before dark. Two incidents broke the tediousness of the march. About noon we espied, far to our right, what was evidently an incubator, and Lorcas Tomal directed Taras Tarkas to investigate it. The latter took a dozen warriors, including myself, and we raced across the velvety carpeting of moss to the little enclosure. It was indeed an incubator, but the eggs were very small in comparison with those I had seen hatching in ours at the time of my arrival on Mars. Tars Tarkas dismounted and examined the enclosure minutely, finally announcing that it belonged to the green men of Warhoon and that the cement was scarcely dry where it had been walled up. "'They cannot be a day's march ahead of us,' he exclaimed, the light of battle leaping to his fierce face. The work at the incubator was short indeed. The warriors tore open the entrance and a couple of them, crawling in, soon demolished all the eggs with their short swords. Then, remounting, we dashed back to join the cavalcade. During the ride I took occasion to ask Tars Tarkas if these Warhoons, whose eggs we had destroyed, were a smaller people than his Tharks. I noticed that their eggs were so much smaller than those I saw hatching in your incubator, I added. He explained that the eggs had just been placed there but, like all green Martian eggs, they would grow during the five-year period of incubation until they obtained the size of those I had seen hatching on the day of my arrival on Barsoom. This was indeed an interesting piece of information, for it had always seemed remarkable to me that the green Martian women, large as they were, could bring forth such enormous eggs as I had seen the four-foot infants emerging from. As a matter of fact, 
the new-laid egg is but little larger than an ordinary goose-egg, and as it does not commence to grow until subjected to the light of the sun, the chieftains have little difficulty in transporting several hundreds of them at one time from the storage vaults to the incubators. Shortly after the incident of the warhoon eggs, we halted to rest the animals, and it was during this halt that the second of the day's interesting episodes occurred. I was engaged in changing my riding cloths from one of the thoats to the other, for I divided the day's work between them, when Zad approached me, and without a word struck my animal a terrific blow with his longsword. I did not need a manual of green Martian etiquette to know what reply to make, for in fact I was so wild with anger that I could scarcely refrain from drawing my pistol and shooting him down for the brute he was but he stood waiting with drawn longsword, and my only choice was to draw my own and meet him in a fair fight with his choice of weapons or a lesser one. This latter alternative is always permissible, therefore I could have used my short sword, my dagger, my hatchet, or my fists, had I wished, and been entirely within my rights, but I could not use firearms or a spear while he held only his longsword. I chose the same weapon he had drawn, because I knew he prided himself upon his ability with it, and I wished, if I worsted him at all, to do it with his own weapon. The fight that followed was a long one, and delayed the resumption of the march for an hour. The entire community surrounded us, leaving a clear space about one hundred feet in diameter for our battle. Zad first attempted to rush me down as a bull might a wolf, but I was much too quick for him and each time I sidestepped his rushes he would go lunging past me, only to receive a nick from my sword upon his arm or back. He was soon streaming blood from a half-dozen minor wounds, but I could not obtain an opening to deliver an effective thrust. Then he changed his tactics, and fighting warily and with extreme dexterity he tried to do by science what he was unable to do by brute strength. I must admit that he was a magnificent swordsman and had it not been for my greater endurance and the remarkable agility the lesser gravitation of Mars lent me, I might not have been able to put up the creditable fight I did against him. We circled for some time without doing much damage on either side, the long, straight, needle-like swords flashing in the sunlight, and ringing out upon the stillness as they crashed together with each effective parry. Finally Zad, realizing that he was tiring more than I, evidently decided to close in and end the battle in a final blaze of glory for himself. Just as he rushed me, a blinding flash of light struck full in my eyes, so that I could not see his approach and could only leap blindly to one side, in an effort to escape the mighty blade that it seemed I could already feel in my vitals. I was only partially successful, as a sharp pain in my left shoulder attested but in the sweep of my glance as I sought to again locate my adversary, a sight met my astonished gaze which paid me well for the wound the temporary blindness had caused me. There, upon Dejah Thoris' chariot, stood three figures, for the purpose, evidently, of witnessing the encounter above the heads of the intervening Tharks. There were Dejah Thoris, Sola, and Sarkoja and as my fleeting glance swept over them a little tableau was presented which will stand graven in my memory to the day of my death. As I looked, Dejah Thoris turned upon Sarkoja with the fury of a young tigress, and struck something from her upraised hand, something which flashed in the sunlight as it spun to the ground. Then I knew what had blinded me at that crucial moment of the fight and how Sarkoja had found a way to kill me without herself delivering the final thrust. Another thing I saw, too, which almost lost my life for me then and there, for it took my mind for the fraction of an instant entirely from my antagonist. For as Dejah Thoris struck the tiny mirror from her hand, Sarkoja, her face livid with hatred and baffled rage, whipped out her dagger and aimed a terrific blow at Dejah Thoris. And then Sola, our dear and faithful Sola sprang between them. The last I saw was the great knife descending upon her shielding breast. My enemy had recovered from his thrust and was making it extremely interesting for me, 
So I reluctantly gave my attention to the work in hand, but my mind was not upon the battle. We rushed each other furiously time after time, till suddenly, feeling the sharp point of his sword at my breast in a thrust I could neither parry nor escape, I threw myself upon him with outstretched sword and with all the weight of my body, determined that I would not die alone if I could prevent it. I felt the steel tear into my chest, all went black before me, my head whirled in dizziness, and I felt my knees giving beneath me. End of chapter 14